Hello and welcome to the Headphone Dialogue episode 3. I'm joined today by Mad Economist and Ishka to talk about Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. All right, this is probably the only the only uh, RMAF show. Well, I don't know how many there are in total, but this is probably the only one where only a third of the the panelists, so to speak, actually went to RMAF. So, yeah. Um, it's probably going to be somewhat like an uh, interview free for all type of deal. Um, we've got Kyle here, who's the person that actually went to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest this year and actually did some pieces for uh, for it over on uh, headphone.com. Is that right? Yep, headphone.com. Perfect. That's how you like it. And we've got Mad Economist, obviously, from Cascadia Audio. You can also call me Blaine. Yes, Hi, with a big B. Hi, Kyle. Hi. <laughs> you know, you can call me Blaine with a big red B emoji if you want. Exactly. It's a free Absolutely. country. Except where yeah. you live. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. This is just communist Germany. But All right. so, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. That's good. All right, so let's move on from this. What were you going to say? Matt. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm going to ask Yes, I. Things. I uh, I was I was actually just rereading um, your impressions at RMAF uh, this morning in preparation for this. Uh, I'd like to compliment you for them. You've got like the yeah. most readable impressions of anyone that I've seen go to shows. Thank you. A lot of the time, I just kind of skip over those because a lot of times it's uh, a bit fluffy. Yeah, um, that's what I try to avoid. Yeah, I. I almost feel like, particularly since we're gonna we're you know on the show and we'd like to get a little bit of you know airtime out of it, it might have, should be interesting to sort of expand on some of them. There's um some of the impressions where you were so concise that you know you got across the very core. You know, is this worth your attention? You know, mm -hmm. here's what I thought of it. Stuff pretty fast, but uh, like I was curious about um, you went over all the high fi man stuff in pretty solid detail. But I yeah. was curious about some of the other uh, some of the other high end headphones you tried there, like uh, the TH909 and the Empyrean. Both of them you have good sound impressions on, but I was curious if you, there's anything more that you because you had you had sort of uh, mixed commentary on both of them, but it, mm -hmm. but it was kind of clipped for headphone, I think, just you know for space. So I was mm -hmm. curious if there's anything you'd like to sort of expand on about those or some of the other high end stuff because there was a lot of that there. Yeah, the TH909, I think I kind of made that concise on purpose because the rep there, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name now, but he seemed like he was offering to send a TH909, so I figured, oh, I might as well just write like concise things and then write a lot more about it later. Uh -huh. So hopefully that happens. But for the most part, I was really worried that the TH909 would be kind of like what would happen if you took... Uh, like a normal TH, like a THXOO or a TH900 and took the rear cups off, which when I did added like 10, 15 extra decibels of bass from like 20 to, I want to say 60 hertz. And like, all oh, you could hear is sub bass. It's ridiculous. You but so loud. <laughs> it's really funny to hear. Like people who have one should definitely try it at one point, but I'd, <laughs> I'd be surprised if anyone kept it like that. But the TH-909 was a lot more reserved in the base than I expected. It's about TH-900 level, I want to say, if not maybe a little bit more. Huh. And it doesn't have that really bad lower mid-range dip that I find like really annoying for any sort of low instrument or low male vocal because it removes so much of the body that it's not really like authentic sounding to me. Yeah, it's like the worst part of the TH-900. I really like all of the other TH series for not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, the flagship is the one that has the most like annoying tonal issue. Yeah, but I mean, also, the same yeah, issue I had with the HDA20. Like, yeah. It's not, not as extreme, not as extreme by any means, but it's definitely there. And it's like, I don't understand why they keep dipping the lower mid range. I mean, it's definitely mm -hmm. something to do with the acoustics itself, but also they, I mean, somebody told me. This is definitely yesterday, but uh, that that Axel Grell actually said that they could have tuned out the dip or like dampened it out, like in a way that it's not as deep. But they chose uh, they chose not to, and you know, 
I don't know, Matt, can you speak on like why they would do that, maybe? Um, well, I I'm not so versed in the internal acoustics of the HD A20. It's a very interesting headphone, but I've never had a chance to take one apart. I'd really like to. Um, for the, I mean, for the TH series, we obviously see that you can, for those sorts of dips in ported sort of reflex, closed back, closed front volume designs, you can change the point of the null and attenuate it quite a bit, and you can damp it quite a bit. Um, there, there's trade-offs, and a lot of it varies by the internal acoustics. I'm sorry, I'm sounding really vague here, but like, there's there's a lot of things that are in play. Um, I don't know why, in particular, for the 820, they would have chosen to do it that way. Um, and the 800 was a fairly unique headphone acoustically, and the 820 seems to follow from that, so I couldn't really comment. It's possible they consider it to just be a more ideal tuning target. Um, I don't think at least they haven't Sennheiser hasn't voiced like that historically with their closed back designs, but it's possible that they're, you know, they're changing their stance on that from some new internal research for the TH series. I actually think it probably was an intentional choice because, um, maybe as, as a consequence of some of the other things they were doing with the tuning, but it's worthy of note that the original, uh, closed you know integrated closed uh fostered biocellulose headphones like the the denon d2000 5000 7000 they didn't feature that dip um whereas the th series which came out after them did so I, in that case i think it's probably more of a consequence of the changes that they were making to the balance of the bass and the mids but it could also be that some companies have some reason to believe that a dip there might be preferable to say a boost there which is another common feature that people tend to find thickens things a bit too much okay mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense but, but I, mean, I, I wouldn't me, want to speak for them i mean this is very loosely but to me i would always say that the hd 800 sounds a little more diffuse feel tune and the hd 20 sounds a little bit more harmon target tune subjectively speaking I um just not not uh, not obviously it's not like on there yeah. but it's like vaguely more you know tending more towards these where this is like where they differ i think quite a lot anyways um you uh, did you listen did you listen to the h20 before rmf no but so the first time i tried the a20 was i'm pretty sure on the head amp table so i used it off of their new gsx mini and I really, really did not like that headphone. Like the amp seemed fine. Like I tried it off other headphones and it was like fine. So I can't really blame the amp. But the A20 just sounds so completely wrong in a way that I find like shocking for a $2,400 $2, headphone. Like I honestly can't think of anything good to say about it other than I guess like maybe if I were in a quiet enough room, I'd appreciate the better detail retrieval. And I can understand people thinking that's super important. But since I don't really listen to detail heavy music, I don't think it's a headphone that I would ever consider listening to music with for fun. So is your a problem basically mainly with the mids then? Or did you find it was, the travel problematic as well? It was everything. Like the bass sounded bizarrely muddy, even by like $100 headphone standards. And like the mid-range was obviously problematic. And the treble, like, I don't mind the 6K peak on the HD800 at all. And sometimes I could honestly use a little more treble from the HD800. But the 820 has this really bad mid-treble peak that instantly bothered me. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I personally, me and Fiddler both didn't have any problems with the treble in terms of peaks or bumps mm -hmm. or anything. It sounded actually like, to me, like the best treble I've heard in a closed back headphone. Really? That's what I'd probably say. That might uh, be for the. Oh, sorry. Good. It's that a big caveat. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, no, no. You go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, it, it's a it's a pretty big caveat in my opinion, but and I I have to say that I have not heard a lot of the very top end closed back headphones. Mm -hmm. Also heard the Z1R, and personally, if I would stack up the A20 against the Z1R, I take the A20 over the Z1R myself. I think they're mm -hmm. both comfortable. Um, personally, I I was a, a lot more offended by the, 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 the treble peak in the 
Z1R, but also the whole treble timbre was more off than the 800. Mm -hmm. Like it had like none of the like the lower treble, but all of the mid or it, all of like the 9K, and it, it just sounded a little off balance to me personally. Um, and yeah, the bass was better on the Z1, I, I'd probably say, but uh, you know, the, the bass on the A20 is not very spectacular, but I didn't, I wasn't that offended by it, to, to be quite honest. Like, it's it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely not as good as I expected, and it's not as good as the Open 800. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it's not even, it's it's pretty big difference, actually, if you compare the bass and you listen for the actual bass detail, the actual mm -hmm. texture, then you, you, you'll you notice a big difference. But um, I, I, I wasn't like super offended because it's just like, oh, well, this is just some nice warmth. This is just some, it, it, it just it kind of um, gives you like some low end to like stack the other music on top to give you some warmth, I think, because mm -hmm. the, the headphones are kind of more tuned to be um, not, a, not a monitoring headphone. I would think, at least I hope so, because yeah. if they did, that would be kind of, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd probably say they failed. Um, so it, it, for hi-fi listening, um, it's, <laughs> sorry, I'm reading chat. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it can be pretty nice, depending on what you like, is my opinion. On that headphone, mm -hmm. but I I'd definitely not buy one, and I'd probably find it hard to recommend it at the price that it's at right yeah. now. Like I used like to make sure that it wasn't like a bum unit. I used a few more, and I made sure to take care. Like I kept in mind how good the seal is because I know how seal problematic it is, and I honestly thought the base was like too elevated mm -hmm. in a way that was like unnatural because of the low mid dips so it kind of sounded like it sounded heavy handed in a sense and then kind of like nothing and then mid-range and treble yeah i think i know what you're saying yeah it's kind of uh it's not oh, it's not hollow but uh it's like this just yeah i know what you mean that there's like something missing and then it sounds like off kilter Mm -hmm. When there's a discontinuity between boosted bass and recessed lower mids it always sounds kind of unnatural to me yeah. Thanks for putting it so eloquently, man. That's why we have you. <laughs> I, I was going to say also. But, yeah. um, okay, so and you asked about the, <laughs> what were you saying? <laughs> we just all tried to see the floor at once. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, uh, one thing but, I was just uh, going to say for how different you guys' impressions are of the HD820 treble, it's kind of interesting to point out that if it's anything like the HD800 in that respect, how you naturally wear it on your head probably is a pretty big factor yeah, as well. Yeah. I think oh, that's a big yeah, that, that, that could explain the mm -hmm. the bump that that ish that bothered Ishka, but didn't bother me. That I mean, yeah, precisely. Yeah, like I usually wear the eight hundred more towards the back of my head. Okay, I, I I like centered. Like I have like I try to have like an even uh, even um, distance all around my ear to the pad. Yeah, I follow like the old Meyer audio thing where usually instead of like centering it, you have kind of a little bit down and back but like to be fair actually the the angle so so the shape of our head would hate head well i can't speak mm -hmm. the shape of our head will de determine the angle that the driver is actually yeah in relative to our uh, ear canal and also like the, the angle of our ear canal so that you know even all those things like how high it wears on your head and you know what type what, what shape of jaw you have that that can all change the hd820 and hd800 designing headphones yeah and <laughs> you know that's why it's so tough to compare them that's why I, I i i still have a rough time comparing the hd800 and the hd800 s like, i i think i hear the difference in the bass mm -hmm. but like everything in the treble is so tough to go back to back and because i put it on and then i put the other one on and i think i hear difference and then well, if I just move that half an inch for you Americans on the right side or on the left side, um, then maybe the comparison is not even even anymore. So, um, so we have been drawn slight. This is very interesting. We've drawn been drawn slightly off of RMAF, and we're on yeah. a decently short time limit here. 
Yeah. So I was hoping we could pick uh, Kyle's brain a little bit more on that one while we have the time. Uh, did you want to hear more about the Empyrean? Yes, I, I'm yeah, really intrigued sure. by that. Yeah, so was I. Um, I didn't really know how much it costed, so I didn't really like pay attention or consider that a factor in how I perceived it when I first used it. And it was super pretty. It felt like super sturdy too. The pads were Alcantara, I think, and super soft. And then the sound was just super, just not what I was expecting. Like, it sounded like a vintage planar headphone. I've had like, I don't know, at least 10 or 15 of those. And they have this similar like, uh, stuffy sort of low resolution sort of sound that isn't really, it's good for like low, I don't know, I guess like, the way that Drew mentioned, like, talked about the Empyrean was that it's like the headphone version of the YouTube channel Lo-Fi Beats to chill and listen to and study to or something like that. And it sounded a <laughs> lot like that. Like, I was really disappointed by the sort of congestion and lack of resolution, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. So what amps did you try it off? Only had a um, this weird amp. I can't remember what it is. There's a picture of it on the website that I'm looking at now. Um, it looks really pretty, but very yeah. strange. It was some. I'm pretty sure it was an OTC, but it could have been an OTC, which is a really weird combination. And I want to say the brand is Darid, but I could be wrong. Okay, is it just me or is Kyle just cutting? Open yeah, I was going to say, I think that I thought really? I was having internet I, problems. For me too. But um, yeah, I think that one of us is having an internet connection issue. It could They're be. trying to censor us. <laughs> but um, as far as sound goes, they had this really weird peak at 4 to 5K that made everything sound really nasal. Hmm. Yeah, that was a pretty common theme for the things that I heard. And There's that's not a lot of peaks there. Yeah, and like a lot of different headphones. And that's not something I can think of off the top of my head that's super popular. So, um, moving on then. Stuff that had it? Yeah. Uh, the Ether did. It, the Ether 2 did. Um, what else did? The Verite. Uh, uh, the what? The Verite. The ZMF Verite. Uh, well, basically all the Hi-Fi Man stuff, but that's like their thing. Yeah. The ADX five thousand, which is also their thing. Can uh, you talk? Can you like talk more about the the Verite? Maybe I'm I'm always okay. interested um, in Dex doing. Well, since apparently it wasn't a final tuning, I don't know how live anything I say is. But if it's ninety five percent, it's probably just fixing like little problems. And for the most part, I really liked it. Like as far as or compared to the other headphones there, I think I liked the Verite more than anything else there. And I'd have to have it next to a Utopia to figure out which one I like more, but there's actually a pretty good I would like it more than the Utopia. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it doesn't have that like sort of metallic, tingy sound texture, timbre that the Utopia has. Yeah, Utopia can sound like a little hard. I don't know. That's like... Mm -hmm. The way I describe it. Yeah. And the bass actually is really well done, especially for like. You're cutting out a lot, I think. Maybe. Really? Do you want to like rejoin? Yeah, sure. I can try that. Is this better? Is it cutting out? Yeah, it sounds uh, good so far. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, but yeah, what was I saying? Um, yeah, the bass is really well done. It actually rumbled a lot like the Utopia did, which is something that I haven't heard in many open headphones other than the HE6. Yeah, the Utopia has like highly unique. Well, I mean, I guess all of, all the focal open stuff, sort of. But you know, relative mm -hmm. to the general field of open backed dynamics, it really stands out for its base, in my opinion. Yeah. So overall, I was really impressed with it. If anything, if I wanted to fix any fix anything, they did seem a little bit too dip between one to three k, and that's like a personal thing because I'm super sensitive to that because I kind of like some extra shout. Oh yeah, I know, I know. You know, like all the super forward <laughs> stacks headphones. 
Oh yeah, wait, what? What? <laughs> I'm talking about like that you do like the the super forward stacks headphones. Nah, the only stacks I like that I could I would consider for it is the 4070. Like I'm not a fan of the 009 because oh, I think okay. the tone the timbre is really weird to me. Oh yeah, you talked about the treble, I think, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, the treble and the midrange, yeah. Kyle in general I, is kind of uh, known for his sort of so-so on stacks. Yeah, like I liked, I had a 007 Mark II that I did the base port mod on, and I thought it was pretty good. But I also couldn't really think of much music that I would pick that over the H800 for. Like I liked it, I liked the stacks more for like simple folk music and stuff like that. But I thought it was kind of stupid to have like. $2,500 of gear relegated for like two music genres. And the zero really is on us who, uh, who don't have that, that diverse a taste. Yeah. <laughs> you, you did hear the 009S, right? Um, which yes. It's kind of like more of an incremental change, maybe we would it say. It was kind of like HD800 versus HD800S. Oh, okay. From what so, I heard it, from how so, I heard it. Yeah. So, hmm. like, it sounded thicker. The treble didn't sound as clean. But it's basically a more consumer-friendly sound that I could see a lot more people going for if they didn't like the 009. But personally, I'd rather have the 009 than the S1. So sort of the exact HD 800 thing? Basically, yeah. Like, it oh, kind of takes like... away what made the 009 special. Oof. That's really well, unfortunate. That's rough. The 009 was really a special headphone. Yeah. yeah. I, think I mean, it's, it's still there pressure. for the most part, but it's like 90% in... And like, if you're paying, how much is it now? Like, thirty five, forty five hundred. Depends on the exchange rate, and if you count the yeah, amp, but yeah, that that's area. true. And like, I know, um, at like, uh, Fuji Avic, you can get um, double nines for around two thousand now used. Yeah, Dang, that's a good deal. It's, yeah, they're not very expensive used in in Japan. Like most stacks on, I. I really uh, wish I'd bought a, an SR four or four when I was there. They were like a hundred fifty mm -hmm. bucks or something. That's like ridiculous. That. Yeah, They're, and they sound so nice for that price. I think I was actually like that. This this is like my LCD two, but better, and but well, apart from the bass maybe, but it, overall I preferred it. And it, like it did that that warm kind of sound or somewhat warmish sound, but it had better vocals. So. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that headphone. And if you want to buy cheap stacks and you want to buy expensive plane tickets, you can go to Japan. <laughs> if you buy enough stacks, it pays for the price. Honestly, yeah, it would even out. <laughs> yeah, probably. You could probably flip some. Yeah, exactly. The customs won't know what the fuck you're fucking buying. Oh, my God. Just tell them that it's filled with trash bins. <laughs> it's filled with cling wrap. Exactly. <laughs> This is just my collection of novelty-sized garbage bins and cling film. <laughs> <laughs> Do not tax. <laughs> totally unsuspicious package. Anyways, oh, so right. uh, oh, sorry, you first. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say. Um, so hearing about the different things that you talk about that you heard, I would think the your favorite thing was the the the. The ZMF then the Verite. My two favorite things were the Verite and first, like bizarrely, the Sony IER Z1R. Oh yeah, talk about that one. That one's uh, like metal, and yeah, it's, it... it's metal and it's super heavy, and the fit is super awkward. But like, legitimately, I think it sounds more tonally correct than almost all flagship headphones. Crazy. So describe wow. the sound. It like. The bass was a little bit elevated, and it was sort of on the warm side, but not overly done like what I like. I thought the M7 and M9, which are the two models down from the I, I guess the Z1R, and the mid range was. Hold on, what did I say? Um, the mid range didn't have any weird uh, peaks or dips or anything, other than maybe a little bit of something around four to five k that added some extra like spice or whatever to vocals. The treble, I feel like it could be fit related or something, but I could have used a little more mid treble, which is like something I almost never say. Oh, okay. Which which tips did was were on there? I didn't check. Oh, it's that's probably really important. You should. Yeah, it's probably like 
the well, it, um, probably stock tips. They felt like, like the hybrid tips. Okay, like the Sony, they're like smaller bore, but very soft silicone, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, I think so. so. I I think if you want a little more treble, you could probably switch those tips and have that fixed right up. Yeah. Probably. You don't want to eq but yeah that sounds that sounds promising so so mm -hmm. the bass is slightly emphasized was it uh tight sounding did you compare it to like no yeah tune? it wasn't it really wasn't that muddy and like i well, i haven't heard an echo tune in a while oh, okay. but um yeah i only got to try the sony ims which is a shame because i really wanted to try the other stuff there like the pp8 and the zeus and 64 audio stuff and i can talk about those but i don't want to color your opinion <laughs> But um, yeah, I like I thought it was good enough to the point where like even at like seventeen hundred dollars, where it's at its accessory jack now, I'm like legitimately considering saving up for one. Oh, that that's pretty that's crazy. High price. Yeah, that's yeah. high price coming from you. Even even with the the awkward fit, you know, you, it seems like yeah. it seems like something that you in it's particular like would I wouldn't be able to run in. But yeah. since lately, um since I'm like living in an apartment where speakers aren't too much of a problem, any situation I'd use open headphones, I'd just use speakers anyway. Oh, just like me, yeah. That's the yeah. same situation I am. So I just have IEMs and, and speakers and that's, you know, that's all mm -hmm. I need. Must be Basically. nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you're designing closed back headphones, right? I mean, you know, I like both. You gotta have that out ahead oralization. <laughs> That that's a great word. <laughs> uh, the worst part is I used the wrong one. It's localization, but I like oralization better. So I'm yeah, you do. <laughs> oh yeah. come on now. <laughs> that's thing. In, that's that's thing. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> We're supposed to keep that for the friggin' blooper reel. <laughs> this whole show's been a blooper reel. <laughs> Your whole life's been a blooper reel. All right, come on. Let's not bully each other, okay? No bullying. <laughs> you started I'm, it. <laughs> I'm not allowing this. <laughs> All right. Okay. I actually, I did have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I was just going over my notes, and something I had underlined was to ask you about, um, and, and you were pretty clear about what you felt about them. Um, yeah. In, in the in the, your commentary on on headphone.com plugging anyone yeah. who's listening to this should read that because it's very clear. Um, link in the description. But, uh, yes, link in the description. You know, like and subscribe. Um, but the I, I was wondering if you had any more details on those uh, twin pulse headphones. Oh that, my god! Uh, which, I, feel, uh, <laughs> I feel so bad about saying such negative things about them because they were li like literally the nicest people there maybe but, uh, not really. they were super nice um when i i first connected it to some dev i can't remember what it was but it kind of like the button i want to say looked like the visio icon or it could be misremembering but i was like okay um these are weird the mid-range isn't really there the bass is kind of muddy i didn't say that to them i was like oh they sound interesting because that's the appropriate thing to say at shows if you don't like something um but then they had me try it out of the Quest style amp, and it sounded like even muddier. Like I tried the GS one thousand like forever ago, and I don't like it. And I'm like not afraid to say that I actually don't mind Grados, but like this is like legit, legitimately one of the worst things I've ever heard. Wow! And, that... and you said it's a dual driver design. Yeah, they connect two drivers in or in parallel or whatever, one on top of the other, and then oh, for some. reason, yeah, there's some like sort of science that they they make. They're, bo they're both firing towards the other. Wait, how? I was gonna ask, how do oh. they fit two drivers into a Grado cup? Because the only way I could think would be like an uh, isobaric sub, where one pretty, fires forward and the other backwards. It's a pretty deep cup, and the oh. driver I want to say is um, maybe an inch and a half thick. Huh. Maybe so, so they are stacked. They're stacked, yeah. Like they showed the driver in, a, like they showed a disassembled driver, like exploded. That's one it's really cool, cool. too bizarre. I so, like thought the fit and finish was really nice, and I was expecting it to cost like I don't know, maybe a thousand dollars, and I would sort of understand that if like 
Grado can make the PS one thousand like seventeen hundred dollars. Why can't they make it like fifteen? Like this really nicely built thing costs fifteen hundred, but it costs twice that. And I was really confused. It's like one of these things where you think, who who's buying these? Yeah, realistically, you know, because they don't look. I mean, to me, they don't look like three thousand dollars. No, no, just. Uh, saying that carefully but uh, you know to each their own it's just uh interesting that where these companies just come from uh, i like i like seeing it i like seeing new companies i like seeing people do do new stuff it's just uh, obviously not everybody's gonna gonna succeed <laughs> yeah like although we do wish them all the best <laughs> yeah I, like, I want them to succeed because they were so nice but they really shouldn't have made such an expensive headphone or I like think, if they made it cost a thousand dollars, I can sort of see where they're coming from. Is this I don't agree with their definition of neutral, which is what they said they tried to make them as neutral as possible. But yeah, I think they're nice to look at. <laughs> is this like is this the this company's first product? Do you know that? They, no, well, Spirit Labs has a few different things. They have these Grado replacement driver things that you can put in a cup. Like, kind of like the Magnums and... Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, and they also modified some bears, I think. They made those really pretty aluminum cup bears that I want to say cost 700 or so. And they add some sort of internal damping and stuff like that. But this is their first, like, real headphone that isn't a modification. Right. Yeah, I'm looking at their website and these, I mean, there's some beautiful pictures on there for sure. And some mm -hmm. very, very big price tags. Anyways, so... Um, I actually have a yeah. picture of their um, their driver. I actually was curious oh. because of how you described it. That's, uh, th this is how apparently they've had it rigged up. I hadn't known that they were spirit labs. I, was trying, I tried to find Twitter, oh. but it turns out that's yeah. a really common phrase. Um, <laughs> So that, that is legitimately, they've done it, it looks like an isobaric subwoofer. Um, mm -hmm. Except with both drivers angled forward, although I don't know what the polarity of the wiring is. Although, presumably, if they're both angled forward, I guess probably the same <laughs> polarity. Um, I think they said they wired it in series. Well, the, yeah, but you, you can do a series arrangement yeah, where oh, yeah. plus terminal goes to plus or where plus terminal goes to minus. Mm -hmm. um, I'd imagine probably plus to plus in this case, since they're probably trying to keep pressure constant. Yeah. But um, that is a very intriguing design, although I'm really confused that they tried to do that in a Grado housing, where, I mean, that's usually the simplest possible acoustic design. It's, you know, sealed baffle mounted to your head, you know, sealed from the back, mm -hmm. mounted to your head with a foam pad. Uh, do you know anything about Spirit Labs other than you know their their country of origin? Like uh, um, you mentioned, they were Italian, I think. Yeah, they're Italian. I wanted to buy their drivers because I've had a Grado frame and some cups for like oh, probably two years now, but I've always pushed it aside. But I'd known nothing other than that. I've huh. seen some measurements of their drivers, and they did seem to have some really nasty 10k peak, I think, and then some dipped upper mid range when you have the G pads that they use now. So it sounded basically what you would expect. Like Okay. Yeah. So, I, don't I don't know how to put that like any better, but they sounded no, super yeah. distant. So <laughs> super distant and muddy. Not not a real recommendation from you on these. <laughs> Unless you like have bought every headphone and really like how these look. Right. Well that's some consumer advice for you guys there. <laughs> I think I think people maybe should take not take consumer advice from us in general. Wait, wait, no, no. One of us is a legitimate audio journalist. Please. I mean, you should you should definitely take you should weigh everything that Kyle says it, like with the highest possible authority. But if you only follow Kyle's advice, I think you'll end up. You're not gonna like anything. Yeah. <laughs> about Kyle, I mean myself, obviously. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. if you only follow your advice, you'll only end up owning a Kustoon. <laughs> Which is not a very terrible fate, I'd uh, I'd say. Yeah, my point is made. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, 
we've talked about a lot of headphones. Like, is there any amps that stood out to you or like DAX? I didn't pay too much attention to the amps or DAX. Um, I did see what, how, um, Sony's new like 5000 portable amp. And I was super excited to see it, but they only had us use them with the MDR Z1Rs, which is not a headphone I like, so I didn't really glean anything use, anything useful from it. That's such an odd decision from Sony, but which, you know... Is... It makes sense, I guess. If you consider that, like, Sony believes the MDR Z1R is their best-sounding headphone. Yeah, but why didn't they, not, didn't they let you use your own headphones with them? I didn't, well, so. I didn't bring any with me, and I felt kind of weird bringing like asking vendors if I could just take their headphones <laughs> well it's a power move some people yeah. don't ask uh, you know you just cannot just ask hi-fi man uh, or hi-fi man I'm sorry I honestly probably could have but no it was like no that'd be very awkward I was super time constrained too like I was only there for four hours I want to say that's oh fair I, I'd, I'd have focused on headphones as well though, you know mm -hmm. That's okay. yeah, I like the G I didn't like the so um I tried the GSX Mini and I really don't like the GSX Mini uh, GSX Mark II because I think it's just super glary sounding and not very pleasant. But I didn't notice that from the GSX Mini, and okay. I would definitely want to try that again if I wanted a solid state amp other than my ADI2, which I really don't think is gonna happen because somebody to somebody's touching the microphone or anything. I'm sorry. No, it's not me. I think not... there's just some noise on Cal's end. Okay. It's probably the outside. Oh, okay. Oh. Right by the highway. All right, back to it. What were you saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, if the GSX I, Mini. Yeah, the GSX yeah. Mini I thought was pretty solid. Like, if I wanted an upgrade from my ADI2 amp, which I don't think would happen because, in general, I only use solid state for, like, TV listening or, like, review. Well, I guess for reviewing, it would make sense. But it's a lot of money, I'm pretty yeah, sure. What's the price? Two thousand twenty five hundred something like that. Oh, that's steep, yeah. It looks yeah, pretty. I like the blue. It is really cute. You have to <laughs> you have to com compliment them on the blue. Is that anodized? I didn't ask, but it's probably the same finish on all their other amps. Yeah. It, it it looks very pretty, at least. It's, yeah, it's the, really pretty. Uh, and pretty desk friendly. Yeah, it's the small. GSX Mark II was Dynalo derived, right? The Kevin Gilmore design. Yeah. Do you know, do you know if that's true of the Mini as well? I think it's like. A derivative of the Dynalo 2 or the Super Symmetry thing, yeah. I don't completely know how their like naming goes, but yeah. Well, I mean, in this industry, pick from a hat. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just reading this uh, again, and this is really your first time listening to the Aeons this time. Yeah, I've never used. The, I've never had an opportunity to use the wow. Aeons. I mean, I mean you're pre pretty late on that, so. That, yeah, I'm really late on that. <laughs> but anyways, you know, better late than never. So, what did you think? You know, honestly, just... like, if I was bl if I were blindfolded, someone put them on my ears, I would think they're just a T50 RP mod. Yeah, yeah, and I want to say, I I can I think I know exactly what you mean because you you listen to them, and it's not something necessarily tonally that's making you think it that they yeah. sound like a T50 RP mod. It's just that. The detail and you know, I I want to say dynamics. Matt is probably gonna be like some iffy sound, about the yeah. use of that, but they sound so flat. They, they sound, sound so flat. Damn. I mean, like what most T fifty RP mods seem well, like, I kind of forced to do. It just sounds like overdamp. There's no real sort of decay. It just kind of hits you and then instantly leaves. But in a way that's different from stack stuff and just like, it just sounds really wrong to me. I will say re re uh, dynamic. I would have complained more prior to this weekend when I actually did measure a planar magnetic headphone. That is the first <laughs> case of mid range compression I've ever seen in a headphone. So uh, at this point, I'm reserving judgment. You know, it could well be there is some mid range compression in some of these, you know, new planers that just I haven't seen before. Oh, uh, my, my, my weekend was shattered by that one. Well, I'm not saying you're right. I'm not saying you're right. I'm just saying but I can't. You would say never you're say that I am right anyway. So, well, uh, hold on. It's not that bad. <laughs> I like I that. I like, right. I like how you comfort me. I also like to say I like I like to you know just go back to right to the start. Matt's highest praise of impressions is that Ishkas were the most readable. So that, <laughs> that this is the highest praise. 
<laughs> that Matt well, no, is willing to hold on. <laughs> hold on. I said that he, he deserves the highest amount of your trust. That is a much higher praise. <laughs> so he's trustworthy and readable. I, I didn't say enjoyable. I didn't say, you know, I didn't say a lot of things, but they were true. They just weren't said. I'm, I'm not perception is reality. I'm not hateful. I'm just, you know, I'm just negging Ishka. Wow. I don't this know how to a long term strategy. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what to say anymore. Oh. But yeah, anyway, so cut I don't know. Fids. <laughs> cut, cut. Um, the Aeons were disappointing for how much they cost i feel like they're not bad sounding headphones i can totally understand people liking them but for 700 dollars, i think that's like three times too expensive for how they sound dang like, that is at like less than 300 like around 300 dollars, i can totally like recommend them but 700 dollars seems really really steep for how like low range they sound <laughs> and that's true both the I'm really hesitating clothes. to say but like they really don't sound like a headphone can you can you mm -hmm. rank them real quick like which one do you prefer I, would, I like the close more than the open okay. like both of them i would place below like the dt 880 six, uh, hd 650k 712 level but those are all open bags yeah well i guess like comparing the open right. but like the open and the yeah. close weren't completely dissimilar I have a like question. You know, family traits. Hmm? This is probably kind of a weird comparison point, given that one of these is now discontinued and they were, you know, four hundred dollars apart. But what do you think about the uh, Aeon Flow closed versus the uh, Oppo PM3? I like don't want to talk too much about the PM3 because I wanted, the one I heard was really weird. Like you know how <laughs> Tile has a couple PM3 measurements, and one of them has like no treble, and the other one looks normal. Yes. Yeah, the, the one other I heard one had looks like trouble. a 650 without. Oh, yeah. oh. oh no! Yeah. The one I heard had no trouble. That's really unfortunate. But they would probably be competitive. They probably sound like on the same level, if not slightly worse. Because like I do have a PM2 and I use that as one of my main portables. And what I remember is the PM3 sounded a lot like the PM2, but like worse, which is totally understandable for half the price and close. Yeah. I've heard I've heard two or three PM3s, and you know, just from memory, I'd probably pick the PM3 over the Aeon Flow closed. That's that, just me. That really wouldn't be surprising. Like I thought, yeah. tonally the PM3, even with like discounting the treble, the bass and the mid range sounded a lot more agreeable than the closed Aeon, which I thought sounded super weird. And like because I'd I'd probably just oh. give the, I'd give the PM3 like a, a low shelf plus six dB at. 300 hertz or something dirty like that. I don't know. <laughs> something really dirty like for on the go. <laughs> and then it, it'd probably be just a better sounding headphone overall for half the price or thereabouts. Yeah, the PM3, like, it's kind of a shame that thing is discontinued. Like, 400, I feel like, is kind of steep. But if you consider it's a portable headphone, like, the sign, okay, like, for a better comparison, the sign, the sign is an upgrade, I feel, from the closed Aeon. To oh, be fair, yeah. the sign sounds really for good. Sure. Sign, you know. Really good. Like just the fit. Considering yeah. like the fact that it's a tiny portable. Like when I first heard like the first one I heard sounded really weird. Like not good not good in the sense that like it sounded way too bloated, the mid range wasn't really there. And then I bought another one. Well, like the first one I tried was a friend's, then I bought one, and it sounded a good bit better and um the measurements that i took on my flat plate coupler were pretty significantly different past 4k huh. that so very strange and then i heard another one which sounded even better than that so now i'm like i wrote a review on the sign and i thought like as a whole it's not the best sounding headphone but compared to all the other portables it's probably the best option and like that's probably where I'd still stand. But considering that Odyssey is really strange about their headphones and not the most consistent, I don't know where I'm going with this. But yeah, no, I, would, I, get, no, I get what you're saying. I would take the sign of the LCD2 CD and the LCD2 closed one that I heard, but the closed one I heard apparently wasn't tuned correctly. 
So oh yeah, the, with the damping thing, right? Oh wait, can we talk about that? I haven't gotten another one, um, so I don't. I haven't heard a corrected one. It's a shame. So yeah, but the 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 sign anyways is it's so divisive on the fit. So mm-hmm. either either you can deal with the fit or you can't. And if you can, we should just you know, get a, a sign, chance. but with you know Aeon Aeon ergonomics. Yeah, that that be I, perfect I, because if the Mobius were just like a sign that fit over the ear, that would have been perfect. Oh yeah, yeah. for three hundred dollars or whatever. Was the Mobius at, uh, at RMAF as well? It was, but I didn't get to try because it was packed. Like I was supposed to talk to, um, oh shoot, I can't remember. Um, I can't remember. Oh, San- I was supposed to talk to Sankar and interview him, but he was never free. He was always talking to other people. And the gone? table, yeah, the table was always way too full, which is a shame because I really wanted to hear the MX and the LCD4 and the LCD4 uh, Z. God, there oh, was yeah. a ton of really interesting stuff at that RMAF. Yeah. yeah, and from all, all accounts, Sanka is, uh, is a nice dude to talk to. Yeah, like everything I've heard. Yeah. Well, then uh, I mean, I, I'm l- looking through the list, and this is only like the MDRZ M Z7 M2, which uh, I don't know. That's not really something that you seem very oh. uh, excited about. Yeah. No, I like. I owned um, a Z7, and I didn't like it too much, but I thought it made like an all right portable headphone if you're like willing to look like an idiot because they're so huge um <clears throat> on this note i did see some japanese person in osaka ee phone wearing his z7 really? on the go yes it's totally doable they do let some sound in and they do leak a little bit of sound but they are usable i guess better than like an lcd xc or something that's like super heavy oh well yeah again setting a low bar but yeah <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. The Z7 M2 just sounded bizarre because there was no guitar attack or like any sort of attack when I listened to a few other songs. That's so weird because this, it sounds like it's so different from the first one, from what I'm reading. I mean, well, the original one also, I feel like, sounded like that because it had a big dip around two kilohertz. Right. I feel like I, I notice a big difference in guitars more with the lower mids personally, but really? um, yeah, I don't know. On attack? Uh, no, wait, no, 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 just on body. Like, yeah, I, I think the cow was talking more about you know, less about oh. the the lower weight, but more about you know, yeah, not the weight, the like initial like hit, I guess. Uh, I yeah. got it. No, I got it. No, okay, yeah, I I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah the, the that you hear from like electric guitars that def- like definitely agree. Yeah. That's that's how the Z7 sounded to me as well. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of like that, but kind of more, which is pretty disappointing. It sounds kind of again. It sounds like something that's uh, that should be way cheaper for what it sounds like, uh, like mm-hmm. the Aeon someone. Although yeah. I don't know, I would probably actually take the Aeon over the original um, original Z7. Although right. I, I'm not completely sure on that one. I don't know. I, I had some issues with the mid range on the Z7. Yeah, no, I bought mine for uh, three fifty, so I didn't think that was awful. Did you want to mod I, that one? I bought it. It changed almost nothing. Oh, you're cutting out again. That's sad. What? Uh, I did mod it and it changed almost nothing. Oh, okay. I, we did hear that one. Oh, yes. So, Matt, is there anything left you you want to talk about? Um, yeah, well, we're, we're running pretty shy of time here, I think, but there was just one thing I wanted to hit, um, just so that we don't come out of this looking like Kyle is a total downer on everything that isn't over a thousand dollars. This one, I know that there was one headphone that was under a thousand dollars that you came away pretty positive about, or at least relatively positive about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was wondering if you want to talk a bit about it. Yeah, I really like the Sundara. Like, it's a shame that there are so many people that had issues with them just not working. I think it was a solder joint that came undone. But, like, yeah. I legitimately would take the Sundara over most headphones I've heard. See, that's, <laughs> like, least. really good. Like, it's the closest thing I can think of to hi fi Man actually making an HE500 successor. Like, it doesn't sound like the HE500, but... It sounds like 
something that's actually worth 500 like the msrp which is something that i find rare especially now yeah it's it's really nice to see that sort of thing in something that's you know these days we're, we're finally getting some population in the 500 to a thousand bracket but mm -hmm. not, not that fast and a lot of them they're flawed yeah so it's really exciting to see something that's honestly when i saw how the sundara measured I was really sad to see the QC reports as well, but when I saw how it measured, I was like, that thing looks like that could be really exciting mm -hmm. as something that people can actually afford. Especially so since really Hi-Fi Man is just kind of like... Sorry. Especially since Hi-Fi Man is like the brand that people sort of make fun of for having headphones that are way too expensive. Like, yeah. it's kind of funny seeing them actually making something that's a really good value. Sadly, people also make fun of them for their QC, and we do see... Yeah. And it's not issue. unfounded, obviously, with the Sundara, since some, they do seem to be breaking. But, yeah. but yeah, they... I mean, first runs always have problems. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, obviously, you do your best to keep things together. And, you know, there, there's steps you can take to make yields better. But sometimes it's going to happen. I think it's sad that this happens so much to hi Man. I'd like to see them do better. But... I also feel like, to some degree, that's sort of the risk of buying early because usually these are the sort of things that get pinned down over time. You know, you don't you don't usually see stuff like this happening. Well, well I mean, maybe with some products, but hopefully, you don't see this happening constantly yeah. over the product lifespan. And I see where you're coming from, and I, I definitely agree that it's the case. And you know, Hyperman is not the only company that that has experienced experienced growing pains when they release a new product um but you know in the end it doesn't make it right and we should still hold these companies to you know to the to, to the standard of of them trying to release a product that's actually you know usable well, for most I, people that yeah, buy it of course they should absolutely you know if, if something is defective and it's not working for users you should replace it immediately and you should absolutely take steps to make sure that whatever problems cause this if it's systemic are resolved and i'm sad to say that at least with some product products and problems high man doesn't seem to have done that as much before there, there were some problems that existed across you know product generations which is just sad to see um I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'm saying here. I guess what I'm basically just saying is, it, I I'm always sad to see it happen, but I, I hope that people won't make make themselves, you know, won't be too put off of a lot of really good value options just because historically there have been problems and growing pains. Mm -hmm. Well, bottom line is, you should go listen to the Sundara. You should go listen to the Verite. You should basically go <laughs> to an audio show and listen to loads of headphones because yeah, the more you listen the more you you have perspective on things and the more you can actually describe what you're hearing so and the I less mean, you can afford well, yeah. well that's that's a byproduct but you know that's something we all have to live with <laughs> so yeah uh, sad sad that you couldn't listen to the susvara though so yeah i mean i got I, like 65 dv on the susvara which isn't loud enough especially since i like to listen at around 85 to 90. Oh, particularly but, a show for an open headphone. Oh, yeah. It was really disappointing. Yeah, I don't I know wish... why they insisted on using their amps. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw, I saw a couple of their Sosvaras around, but they were in this outside room that I didn't think to look at, which is really sad because they also had the final audio D8000. Oh my gosh. Is that Man, their plane? Like, yes. Oh. That's like one of the like two or three headphones that I think is the most neat in this past yeah, year. It's it's been... neat. Their their paper on their well, sort of like paper presentation thing on their um their damping system for it is legitimately fascinating. They seem to have come at planers from a really different perspective than every other manufacturer currently on the market. Yeah, I wasn't like too worried about that because headphone.com is a final audio dealer. So hopefully sometime in the future, I would be able to actually have my hands on one of them for a couple weeks or like be able to be get the measure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Questions. That would be so nice because it's, it seems like somewhat of an elusive headphone at the moment. Mm -hmm. There's not really much out there. I've had some 
some uh, impressions comparing it to an HD 650, but you know, some oh, everything gets compared to the HD 650. So you know, take it with yeah. a grain of salt. I wonder if um, whoever you know, I wonder if I guess Axel Grell is probably the fellow ever feel sort of resentful about the fact that whenever something new comes out that's pretty good immediately everyone always goes to say it's better than the hd 600 or <laughs> hd 650 in this list of ways <laughs> like at some point he's got to be like guys you know this headphone was designed 20 years ago stop stop <laughs> beating up on past me i was working on a budget 20 years ago i mean like to be completely honest, I like the old stuff that Axel's made more than like most of the newer stuff, though. Like, what is he? The HD820, the HD700, um, 630, which I haven't heard. So was the was the 700 his work? I, I actually was unsure about I, that one because I know he said I that he'd been hard. working on the H20 for like seven years. Really? Uh, I I thought I read that in an interview with him, but, but I, it's not I it's not entirely heard. impossible that. The main man Axel Grell would work on multiple headphones. Oh no, episode. absolutely! I ju I'm just not good enough at stalking him to figure out yet. Yeah, I'm, wow. I remember hearing that, so I just kind of internalized it. But I could totally be—I wouldn't be surprised if he had nothing to do with it. I don't know. I honestly, I'd be interested to. I'd love to see more of these. You know, occasionally do like an interview with Axel Grell, but it'd be more really interesting if more of the large companies put more of their their chief R and D people out front to talk to i mean I, particularly now that there's enough of an audiophile press to you mm -hmm. know to justify it a bit more it'd be neat to hear sort of more about the guts of you know the companies where they're they're big enough that it's not just you know where the the, the lead r d guy is also going to every show yeah i was supposed to do that with the abyss guys like the lead r d guy the like lead engineer i'm pretty sure was there and really yeah, I was supposed to. Uh, so I like went up to their table. I asked if I could do an interview, but only the marketing guy was there. He told me to wait for the engineer, and I waited a bit. But as soon as like I found out, like as soon as I found him, I had to leave. So that was pretty disappointing. Oh, man, that'd been really interesting too. Because yeah. uh, aren't they still doing? Um, I think they're the only plane magnetic manufacturer that still uses milled magnets. Really. Yeah, because I know the Abyss, they made a big deal out of the fact that they were using like a single, very large magnetic plate, which had milled mm -hmm. slots. And I think that's also true of the Phi, but I'm not positive. Interesting. You should talk to the person that designed the headband and like maybe <laughs> take a picture <laughs> of, of him and I want to see his head. Oh, come on. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've only tried the Abyss once and it very clearly was not fit correctly because when I listen for like sub bass there was actual silence so mm -hmm. i have no opinion on the abyss no opinion. I'm, sure that, I'm sure that was wrong there's no possible way that could be correct yeah probably yeah. not because it's sure. like people tend to praise it for the bass so exactly you know, you uh, is there anything else well i yeah the ether 2 was interesting it was definitely a step up from the ether flow that's what it's called and but i don't know it's just not two thousand dollars <laughs> i mean not many things are yeah but it's, i don't know like i honestly would take the sundara over the ether two without hesitation but the sundara is open right so they're both open so is the oh ether. oh right yeah the ether c is the close one I yeah. forgot that the, yeah, because for the Aeon, the Aeon is the the regular Aeon is the closed one and the Aeon open is the open. open. Yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of I, I think he's revised the nomenclature though because I saw I have seen it now referred to as the Aeon flow closed or the yeah. Aeon flow closed. I shouldn't. Yeah, but he did that right retroactively. That's Well, I mean, he's trying to keep it consistent. Yeah, I guess I appreciate that. I, I did want to ask, just I know we're like almost out of time here, but um, what over, what headphones in the one thousand to two thousand bracket wouldn't would you take over the Sundara, just off the top of your head? From HD show impressions. 100. Oh, like ever or like at the show? 
Well, no, like, no, no, sorry. Just like from your impressions of it. So I'm saying, you know, with the caveat, you might revise this, but okay, at the moment, uh, yeah. What would you, what would you take over just from the whole world of one to 2k? Well, like obviously HD 800, um, if we can include use, I would obviously get an HE 1000, which like, cause I bought mine for 1000 and I s thought that was a really solid deal. Um, I might take the ADX 5000, but that's kind of a stretch. I'd really have to hear it again. Um, I, sorry. No, no, keep going. I'm sorry. Um, the Aria I thought was super solid. The Ananda did sound better than the Sosvar, I think. Um, the sex, I think I might even take the double and nine over the Sundar. I don't know. I'd have to like really Is still within two thousand dollars, though. Really, <laughs> I mean, use, I guess. Um, then I guess the double of seven, I would take over the Sundar without too much of a question. Fair um, enough. which double of seven? Yes, uh, oh, that's right. The um, the Mark II and the Mark One. I. I haven't heard the two point five. Okay. What else exists? <laughs> um, the clear? The clear, maybe. I would take the ELX over it. I like the ELX more than the clear. Um, probably the ZMF Otter, which I thought, I don't know. It's like a nice sounding headphone, and I can understand it being like a lot of people's favorite headphone, but it just sounded a little too safe. But it is a good sounding headphone. I just like, if you have a bunch of headphones, you probably won't end up using it too much. But if you like are the type to only have, it's like the Utopia, I guess. If you have like only one headphone, I could see that being something you would really like because it was it was good with every, everything I like tried it with, but not amazing. Yeah, one of those headphones where you never have that moment be like, oh God, no, not for this song. Exactly, which is how I feel about the Utopia. Like, I'm not sure I would buy a Utopia because for basically anything, I can think of a better sounding headphone and I could probably buy all those headphones instead of one utopia yeah but you can't uh, buy an automatic switching machine that flips them around on your head you got to do that right. by hand <laughs> um well like i guess in that vein the he6 i would take over it which is not surprising because i consider that my favorite headphone uh what else is there i'm like blanking on headphones what's the zasvara cost used actually i haven't seen oh zasvara yeah i've seen one for four thousand yeah, Oof. I think like three point five to four K is the cheapest I've seen used. Oof. I yeah. think they probably they probably didn't sell that well. <laughs> I would yeah, so, like I see a lot of people saying that they're gonna buy one when like price drops, but I don't think there were enough sold that it would happen like with the HE one thousand where Don't you think that Hyperman is just one day gonna say, Oh, well this headphone is four thousand dollars now or something like that? Well, I can see like that thing. there's like two two outcomes where the used prices stay really high. Either they didn't sell very many, or they sold a decent amount, but nobody resells them. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave that to the viewer to consider what they think is most likely. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I mean, I don't know. There's some headphones uh, like oh, that. Yeah. The HD 800 sold like a friggin' million, and those things stayed really valuable for a long time in the used market. They still kind of are, considering that they were $9.99, like new for a bit, and they still sell for... Seven hundred dollars. That's pretty solid. I really yeah. want to pick one up. I should. I should do it. I just. I wish. I wish I could just do it and not worry about all the other headphones that I still have yet to sell. Mm -hmm. It's a really good reference point headphone. I think that like. It's it's the new HD six hundred six fifty kind of thing in that respect. <laughs> yeah. There's like it's a. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm not in love with how it sounds, but I know if I sold mine, I would just end up buying it again because it's such a good reference and it's something almost everyone looking at high-end headphones has heard. Well, yeah. and also the fact that you've bought and sold quite a lot of them. Yeah. And you've always ended up with one again. I mean, I've only bought and resold it once. That's true. Cause, yeah, because I've had the H... I had the H800 for a solid... Like, oh, two right. Years. You didn't and send. Then, you yeah. Send it around. around. Mm-hmm. And then I accidentally bought one on eBay f when I made an insulting offer. <laughs> oh, don't you hate it when that happens? Yeah. You send out your, your, the abusive offer that's meant to get them to start negotiating with you, and then they just yeah. hit accept, and you're like, oh, shit, you get that yeah, big red pay now. 
<laughs> like um it was selling for i think 600 i was like ah that he won't take 450 and he took it yep. which is a really good deal for an h800 even in the condition mine was in no but, joke yeah <laughs> but we don't talk about that. it because you need your resale value so i mean i got <laughs> it's it's like skyline purple now so oh who did that for you did you do that Udis. you just so nice yes um, but I guess going back, I personally would take the ZMF icon over it too because I like it's not a really natural sounding headphone, but I like the icon just works. Um, I don't know. I feel like I would pick a good amount of headphones over the Sedara, but like nothing is sticking out in my head under the 1000 rank other than the Elex. Just to like Fair kind enough. of how good of a deal the Sedara is, I feel. Especially yeah, since. I'm... Of was selling them for like 250. Jesus, that's nuts. Like, that's the really good side of Hi Fi Man stuff. When they make something that's good, it doesn't seem like, e even for the stuff there's that is really, really well performing when it launches, it still seems to inexorably trend down in price. Yeah, like you could, I saw an HE 560 sell for 170, like the yeah. original V1 with the screws. Good lord. Yeah, I've, I was so tempted to buy a 560 just recently, but I, I just end up not doing it. And I'm not also, sure the, you'd like it. I, yeah, I don't know. The lower mids, maybe. I don't know. Uh, the 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 HG 1000 though, that's like the one other headphone that I have in mind that I would buy aside of the 800 probably. Yeah, if I like had. I Although I did like the clear. <laughs> yeah, but you like the clear. Oh, you need to hear the Alex then. Yeah, you absolutely do. Do you need to ask um, Brian uh, Giacomo <laughs> to borrow his? Oh, uh, yeah. No, Maybe just go to his house. He's, he might actually yeah. sell his. Really? Oh. Point. Yeah, I I feel like he might sell it at some point, but I could be completely wrong. Yeah, he got. He it said that he, he doesn't like having like multiple headphones that fill the same role, but he couldn't figure out what to sell. Mm -hmm. Did he sell his 580? Oh, no, we were just rambling, anyways. What the hell? Thank you for listening to the Headphone Dialogue. If you enjoyed this episode and want to be notified whenever we upload new content, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. If you want to discuss this topic and others, you can do so by joining our Discord server. The link is in the description box below. Until next time, happy listening.